Thank you. It's my pleasure to introduce Professor Daniel Zibla today. Uh, I'm going to read a little from his bio because there are a lot of accomplishments that I don't want to miss. Daniel Ziblatt is the Eaton Professor of the Science of Government at Harvard University, where he's also a resident faculty at the Minda Ginsburg Center for European Studies and Harvard's Weatherhead Center for International Affairs. His research focuses on democratization, democratic breakdown, political parties, state building, and historical political economy with an emphasis on Europe from the 19th century to the present. His first book was Structuring the State, the Formation of Italy and Germany in the Puzzle of Federalism. He's also the author of Conservative Parties and the Birth of Democracy, which won the American Political Science Association's 2018 Woodrow Wilson Prize for the best book in government and international relations. It's also won three other prizes, including the American Sociological Association's 2018 award, Barrington Moore uh, Book Prize. Professor Ziblad co-chairs with Steve Levitsky a new Challenges to Democracy research cluster at Harvard's Weatherhead Center. Today he's here to talk, of, to, talk to us about his most recent work, How Democracies Die, also co-authored with Steve Levitsky. The book is a New York Times bestseller that's currently being translated into 15 different languages. In it, they draw on decades of research and a wide range of historical and global examples from the 1930s in Europe to contemporary Hungary, Turkey, and Venezuela to the American South during Jim Crow. They show us that democracy no longer ends with a bang, but can die quietly, subverted by the very same leaders who were elected to sustain it. With a wealth of insight into how democracies die, and what we can do to prevent such a fate in ours. We are fortunate to have Professor Ziblatt here to conclude this day-long symposium. Please help me welcome him to the stage. Hello, everybody. It's, it's really wonderful to be here. Thank you for the invitation. And to, I'm actually just very grateful to be part of this public forum, which I didn't, I wasn't able to attend all of it today, but it's a fascinating and important set of events that have happened today. So I'm talking at the end of the day, so I appreciate you all being here. Um, I'm going to be talking about the health of our democracy and the role of polarization in that. And so in thinking about the health of our democracy, American democracy, I'm going to be trying to answer a question that actually really motivated the book that I wrote with Steve Levitsky. Uh, and that question is a question I will admit that I never thought I would ask. The question is, could American democracy genuinely be in danger? Could American democracy genuinely be in danger? So I approach this question, though, from a kind of a distinctive angle, along with my co-author. And I will do so also tonight. Uh, because I've spent most of my career um, studying democracies in other parts of the world and in other times. And so from that global angle, uh, and with a kind of broader historical view in mind, the first observation that I just want to begin with is that democracies don't die like they used to. So democracies used to die at the hands of men with guns. During the Cold War, three out of every four democratic breakdowns uh, happened in the form of a military coup. Contemporary democracies die in much more subtle ways. They die at the hands not of generals, but of politicians, prime ministers, and presidents. Leaders use the very institutions of democracy to subvert it. So democracies today often die constitutionally, through referenda, through parliamentary legislation, through court rulings. As a result of this, many citizens often aren't even fully aware that it's happening until it's too late. So in 2011, 12 years into Hugo Chavez's presidency, a majority of Venezuelans, according to surveys, uh, thought they still lived in a democracy. It was clear they no longer did. Similar dynamics are visible today in Turkey, a uh, decade after the AKP's ascent to power, uh, in Hungary and Poland as well. So if democracy now happens at the ballot box instead of in the military barracks, one of the keys to preventing, to, to protecting democracy is preventing these demagogic figures from getting elected in the first place. And it's here, actually, where political parties play a really critical role. Political parties are democracy's gate 
They often don't think of them this way, but because they select the candidates, they have incredible power to keep extremists and demagogues out of office. It's when parties fail to play the gatekeeping role that democracies get into trouble. It's really important, as one thinks about polarization and democracy and threats to democracy, to, to recognize that electoral authoritarians rarely come to power on their own. They almost always come to power with the assist or with an aid from mainstream political parties. Mainstream parties and politicians are often tempted to form Faustian bargains, in a sense, with demagogic outsiders. They often hope they can align with them to tap into some of their popularity and their popular support and also often with the mistaken belief that they can control the outsider. Now this is a bargain that almost always backfires. So in the book we recount in Italy in the 1920s when Mussolini was on the horizon in the early 1920s, a liberal statesman Giovanni Giletti formed an alliance with Mussolini, concluded him on his party list at election time with the hope that he could tap into some of Mussolini's appeal. Uh, in the 1930s in Germany, uh, the German Conservative Party formed alliances, loose alliances, issued joint proclamations and programs with Hitler's party, which was a marginal party in the late 1920s. Uh, this only paved the way for Hitler's ascent to power. And in early 1933, when uh, Franz von Papen, the German conservative statesman, elevated uh, Hitler to chancellor, he assured his conservative friends, don't worry, and the quote from von Papen is, don't worry, within two months we'll have pushed Hitler so far into a corner he'll squeal. So in both Italy and Germany, in, every, in many cases, driven by kind of short-term political motivations, politicians abandon their gatekeeping role. And this often turns out to be a tragic miscalculation. Now in the United States, political parties have actually done a pretty good job of gatekeeping. This is important because in the United States, there's actually been no shortage, shortage of extremist demagogues. Uh, you know, it's, we, we don't have to look, at, just in the 20th century alone, you can think of Father Coughlin in the 1930s, the right-wing radio personality who had tens of millions of listeners, Henry Ford, the founder of Ford Motor Company, <clears throat> rabid anti-Semite, uh, Huey Long in the 1930s, Joe McCarthy in the 1950s, George Wallace, the segregationist governor in the 1960s. It's important to kind of list this cast of characters because Gallup poll data exists going back to the 1930s, showing that each of these figures garnered around 30, 35% approval ratings. So there's really a, nearly a continuous strand in American history of a long, a very robust liberal tradition of an illiberal tradition. You know, it's, I, I don't think there's, there's some kind of dramatic transformation that's taken place in the preferences of American voters. There's been a kind of nearly continuous strand. So the real question is how were these types of figures kept up, despite the fact that they were very popular? And the argument we make in the book is that they were kept up mostly through the presidential selection process. So prior to 1972, uh, the way that we selected our presidents was in what was often described at the time as a system of smoke-filled back rooms. I mean, this was not a very transparent system, not an inclusive system, but this was a system that uh, was worked quite effectively at keeping demagogues out. Party leaders worked as gatekeepers. And what this meant was that party leaders who worked up close with politicians and knew how they dealt with stress and adversity and knew who might be potential demagogues, these politicians at convention time got together and kept out these sorts of figures. So despite all of the shortcomings of this old system, and I wouldn't ever advocate going back to the old system, we have to recognize that this system had a pretty good record of keeping demagogues out. And so what happened in 2016? Well, first of all, Americans of course, adopted a system of binding primaries uh, in 1972. So this is far more transparent, far more open, but it also weakened party leaders' role as a gatekeeper. And so now it's much easier for a demagogue to make it through the kind of obstacle course to a nomination. So that's the first point. But even more critically in a lot of ways is even after candidate Trump uh, won the nomination, Republican party leaders failed a second time, gatekeepers failed a second time, when they clearly all Republican leaders publicly and privately expressed the view that Donald Trump might be a, not fit for office or they thought he might be a demagogue, yet nonetheless they didn't do the one thing that the great Spanish political scientist Juan Linz recommends that politicians do when facing somebody who clearly is a threat to, it, to the established order, democratic order, which is to endorse somebody from the other side. It's of course always difficult to run against, to, to go against one's own side. You might, it means that a party may fa might face defeat. You, it's handing power over to the other side, potentially. But this is really a critical thing that might have made a difference. 
So this is all sort of background to say that in 2016, the United States, we argue, for the first time in two centuries, elected somebody to office, presidential office of the presidency, who was a, was a clearly an explicit, visible threat to democratic politics. But this, of course, does not mean our democracy is doomed. And this is in a way where, where political institution and polarization enters the story. Because it turns out Americans, of course, place a lot of faith in our constitution. We have the oldest and most successful written constitution in the world. And our system of checks and balances have, has constrained many ambitious politicians. But constitutions are not self enacting They don't just enforce themselves. They don't work automatically. Just to give, you, to give you an example, Argentina, a country that my co-author has spent a lot of time studying, is a country that has a constitution that's nearly identical to the American constitution beginning in the 19th century. And yet, Argentina experienced six military coups over the course of the 20th century. So, so the point is, constitutions, it's not just the words on the page that matter. And we make the case that constitutions work best when they are reinforced by robust democratic norms, or unwritten rules. So in our book, we focus on two norms in particular. One uh, we call mutual toleration, or essentially it's accepting the legitimacy of your rivals, so of our partisan opponents. So this means no matter how much we disagree or even dislike our partisan rivals, that we recognize they have a right to compete for office, and if they beat us, to govern. And so in other words, we don't treat our rivals as enemies. The second key norm is a little uh, less familiar, perhaps, which is the norm that we call institutional forbearance. Forbearance means essentially exer act acting with restraint and exercising one's legal right or one's legal power. So it's sort of it's an underutilization of power. Now we don't often think about forbearance in politics, but if you just think in the American political setting, what the president can actually do according to the written word on the page, according to the written law. The president can pardon whoever he or she wants at any point for any reason. The president with a constitutional a congressional majority can change the size of the Supreme Court. If you don't like how the Supreme Court is ruling, you can increase the Supreme Court size, 11, 13, whatever, perfectly legal. If a president's agenda is stalled in Congress, the president can circumvent the process and rule by executive order. The Constitution, of course, doesn't prohibit such action. Think about what Congress can do. Congress, uh, the Senate can use its right of advising consent to block every single cabinet appointee, to block judicial, all judicial appointments. The Congress can impeach a president on any grounds it wants. So the point is that politicians can exploit the letter of the law in ways that eviscerate the spirit of the law. This tendency to exploit the letter of the law, to eviscerate the spirit of the law, is what we call constitutional hardball, drawing on a legal scholar Mark Tushin. So if you look at any failing or failed democracy in the world, today or in the past, you'll feel, find an abundance of constitutional hardball. So Argentina under Perón, Spain and Germany in the 1930s, Venezuela under Chavez, contemporary Hungary, Poland, and Turkey. Constitutional hardball is how even a brilliantly designed constitution gets subverted, and the system of checks and balances gets subverted. It's how judicial and legislative institutions get transformed from watchdogs into lapdogs. It's how checks and balances to generate into gridlock. What prevents a system of checks and balances from descending into constitutional hardball that can wreck democracies is this notion of forbearance. It's a shared commitment to exercising restraint and deploying one's institutional prerogatives. It's rooted in a commitment to the spirit of the law. So think just about uh, presidential term limits. So prior to 1951, of course, the United States placed no, no legal limits on the president's ability to seek re-election. So legally, if re-elected, presidents can be presidents for life. Yet George Washington, of course, famously uh, didn't seek a third term, stepped down after two terms, and for nearly 150 years, no president ever even sought a third term. So even incredibly ambitious and popular presidents, Jefferson, Jackson, Ulysses S. Grant, was an unwritten rule of self-restraint. Take the filibuster. It's another example of forbearance. Technically, a Senate minority can use the filibuster to block every piece of legislation. But historically, the filibuster was used really as a weapon of last resort. Between 1917 and 1960, there were only 30 filibusters. 
So fewer than one year. So these two norms, these unwritten rules of mutual toleration on the one hand, forbearance on the other hand, are what my co-author and I think of as the soft guardrails of our democracy. These unwritten rules prevent normal political competition from descending into partisan fights to the death that have killed democracies in Latin America in the 60s and 70s and Europe in the 1930s. Now, America has not always had these soft guardrails. It wasn't born with them. Our founding fathers really actually never got the idea, really, of mutual toleration. And that's because this idea of legitimate opposition, the idea that the opposing party has a right to compete for office, was really just a notion that was developing in the late 18th century. So as brilliant as the founding fathers may have been, they couldn't quite wrap their heads around this idea. So under President Washington and uh, President Adams, the governing Federalist Party regarded the emerging Jeffersonian opposition as seditious as working for revolutionary friends. Of course, the Jeffersonians thought the Federalists uh, were monarchists and wanted to bring back British rule. This is pretty intense polarization. Both sides viewed the other side as agents of foreign powers. And both sides engaged in egregious hardball, court packing, and other forms of hard the, the passage of the, uh, the Alien Sedition Act. This is intense hardball. And it was really not until the post-revolutionary generation that this norm of mutual toleration or accepting again your rivals as legitimate emerged. But it didn't last long. In the 1850s, Southern Democrats regarded the new Republican Party as an existential threat because Republicans were anti-slavery. And as slavery emerged on the agenda, both sides regarded the other side as traitors to the Republic. As norms eroded, these newly emergent guardrails began to break down. And politics took on a kind of anything goes character. So one historian counts 125 different acts of violence on the floor of the Congress in the lead up to the Civil War. So fist fights, canings, stabbings on the floor of the Congress. Mutual toleration obviously collapsed during the Civil War, and it remained low for a generation after the Civil War. So during Reconstruction, both sides regarded each other's existential threats. This resulted in the 1860s and 70s of an abundance of hardball politics, court packing. Uh, so Supreme Court nominees were blocked. The Supreme Court size was expanded, fraudulent election in 1876. But for very tragic reasons, and this comes again back to the theme of polarization that we discuss in our book, beginning in the late 19th century, Democrats and Republicans began to accept one another as legitimate and began to avoid destabilizing acts of hard work. And in particular, what prompted this was that Republicans gave up on the agenda of racial equality. They gave up on the agenda of reconstruction. Republicans allowed Democrats to disenfranchise blacks in the South. So Southern Democrats no longer viewed Republicans as an existential threat. A kind of tragic truce was achieved. Mutual toleration was restored. Forbearance reemerged. But this great tragic irony that we still live with today is that our norms of mutual toleration and forbearance, preconditions for democracy, were achieved at the price of racial exclusion. And so our democracy was fundamentally incomplete and flawed, but this also meant that beginning of the 20th century, constitutional hardball began to diminish. There was no impeachments, no successful court packings, senators were judicious in their use of the filibuster and their right to advise and consent. And outside of wartime, presidents refrained from acting unilaterally, circumventing Congress and the courts. So for more than a century, our system of checks and balances worked in the 20th century. But again, they worked because they were reinforced by these norms, these ambiguous, in some sense we could think of ambig ambiguous norms of toleration and forbearance. Now as we show in our book, these norms have been unraveling in the United States over the last quarter century. We see this dramatically accelerate over the last several years, but again, began long before the, the current political moment, and really began, we argue, in the 1990s. Newt Gingrich, who became Speaker of the House uh, in 1995, began in the early 1990s to speak to, to, to he told his Republican allies in Congress to use terms like betray, anti-flag, anti-family, traitor, when describing Democrats. Gingrich was also a master of constitutional hardball. He engineered the first Modern government shut down in 1985. The Republican House carried out a, a partisan impeachment, mostly partisan impeachment of Bill Clinton. It was the first presidential impeachment in 130 
So the process of norm erosion really accelerated in the 2000s. During the Obama era, the Tea Party movement radicalized the Republicans, encouraging them to abandon mutual toleration. So Republican leaders like Newt Gingrich, Sarah Palin, Rudy Giuliani, Mike Huckabee, told their followers that President Obama did not love America, that Obama and the Democrats weren't real Americans. The birther movement, of course, went a step further, questioning whether President Obama was even really born in the United States, question, fundamentally questioning his right to be president. So I'll just give you one example. Uh, one Colorado Congressman, Mike Kaufman, declared at one point, I do not know if President Obama was born in the United States, but I do know that in his heart, he's not an American. He's just not an American. Hillary Clinton, of course, received similar treatment. A Republican uh, presidential candidate uh, on live national television at the Republican Convention led the Republican chant to block her up. Now, America has always obviously had an extremist fringe. That was kind of my earlier point here, but this was no longer fringe politics. These were national Republican leaders. This is the vice presidential candidate in 2012. This is the presidential candidate in 2016. This was live on national television at the Republican convention. So leading Republicans were now questioning the basic legitimacy of their rivals for office. So this worries me, and this worries, worries, should worry us all, because what we've learned from studying democracies in other parts of the world is that in the absence of mutual toleration, if you regard your political rivals as enemies, they were attempted to abandon forbearance and engage in an escalating spiral of hardball in order to defeat them. We view our partisan rivals as a threat, as existential threats. We grow tempted to use any means necessary to stop them. And that's exactly what has begun to happen. Politicians have begun to throw forbearance to the wind. So when Republicans won the control of Congress in 2010, they adopted a strategy of outright obstructionism, filibuster use, which had already been increasing under Democrats and Republicans, reached an all-time high. There was actually more filibusters during President Obama's second term than all of the years between World War I and the end of the Reagan presidency combined. President Obama responded with constitutional hardball of his own. When the Congress refused to pass immigration reform or, or climate change legislation, he circumvented Congress and made policy via executive orders. The action was technically legal, but again, violated the spirit of the Constitution. So by the end of the Obama presidency, Republicans, in our view, seemed willing to adopt any means necessary to stop Democrats and prevent them from winning. So 15 states, all of them Republican-led, adopted strict voter ID laws between 2000 and 2016. And most stunning of all, in my mind at least, was the US Senate's 2016 decision not to allow President Obama to even hold hearings on Merrick Garland to fill the Supreme Court vacancy created by Justice Scalia's death. This is the first time this had happened since 1866. All of this was before Donald Trump got elected. So the problem is not just the Demo that Americans elected a demagogue in 2016, it's that Americans elected a demagogue at a point in which our soft guardrails have been corroded. Okay, so why is all of this happening? Well, we argue what's shredding our norms is polarization. Republicans and Democrats have come, according to surveys, and I think generally lots of, there's lots of evidence of this, have come, Democrats and Republicans have come to fear and loathe, loathe each other. In 1960, 5% of Republicans said they would be displeased if their child married a Democrat. Today that number is 50%. According to a recent Pew survey, 45% of Republicans and 41% of Democrats said the other party's policies threaten the nation's well-being. 49% of Republicans and 55% of Democrats say the other party makes them afraid. We have not seen this kind of partisan hatred since the 19th century. And this isn't just traditional liberal conservative polarization. People don't fear and loathe each other over taxes and health care. Today's partisan differences run much deeper. They're about race, religion, and way of life. Our parties have changed dramatically over the last 50 years. So in the 60s and 70s, Republicans and Democrats were culturally actually quite similar. There were huge policy differences, of course, both, but, but demographically, the party's leadership were overwhelmingly white and Christian. Three big changes have taken place. First, the civil rights movement, an achievement of full civil rights and voting rights for all Americans in the 1960s, 
led to a massive and gradual migration of Southern whites from the Democratic Party to the Republican Party, while African Americans became predominantly Democratic. Second, the U.S. experienced a massive wave of migration in the wake of migra uh, immigration reform in the mid-60s, and most of these immigrants ended up in the Democratic Party. And third, by the time of the Reagan era, evangelical Christians who had been evenly split uh, between the Democrats and Republicans flocked to the Republican Party. So what does all of this mean? Well, today the Democratic and Republican parties are culturally and racially quite distinct. The Democrats are mostly a rainbow coalition of urban and educated and secular whites and a range of ethnic minorities. The Republicans, by contrast, remain overwhelmingly white and Christian. This is important because white Christians aren't just a group. They were once the majority, and they once used to sit unchallenged atop this country's social, economic, cultural, and political hierarchies. They filled the presidency, the Congress, the Supreme Court, and governor's mansions. They were the pillars of local communities. They were the CEOs, the newscasters, the movie stars, and college professors. And they were critically the basis of both the Democratic and Republican Party. Those days, of course, are long gone. But losing a majority and losing one's dominant social status can be deeply threatened. Many Republican voters, of course not all, but many feel that the country they grew up in is being taken away from them. And that ultimately is what we argue is driving polarization. The problem is that extreme polarization can kill democracies. This is a major lesson of the failure of democracies in Latin America in the 60s and 70s and Europe in the 1930s. When politics is so deeply polarized that each side views a victory by the other side as intolerable, beyond the pale, then democracy is in trouble. When an opposition victory becomes intolerable, you of course begin to justify ex using extraordinary means to stop this. Things like violence, election fraud, military coups. Of course, Americans haven't reached that point, but we have reached a point where according to exit polls in 2016, one in four Trump voters, one in four people who voted for Trump, believed he was unfit for office. They reported in exit polls, yet they still preferred him to the Democratic candidate. We've reached a point where, according to Gallup, polls over the last couple of years, Republicans have a more favorable view of Vladimir Putin than they do of Hillary Clinton. These are dangerous levels of polarization. Donald Trump, of course, is a, part of symptom of that polarization. He's not just a cause of it. And so his departure won't put an end to it. So what, what has happened in the last 18 months since we wrote our book? Let's say there's both good news and bad news. Good news and not so good news. The good news is that America's democratic antibodies, I think, remain strong. The Trump administration, of course, has confronted lots of pushback on multiple fronts, from media, from civil society, from the courts, from law enforcement agencies. It also faces a robust political opposition. I think last year's midterm elections were really critical. It shows that the United States is not like Russia, Hungary, Turkey, or Venezuela, where authoritarian governments have steamrolled the opposition. The US has a strong opposition, and a strong opposition has ushered in an era of divided government. Divided government will certainly constrain President Trump and make it less likely that he can concentrate power or abuse power. But the not so good news is that the underlying problems of polarization and norm erosion haven't gone away. Our system of checks and balances only works when there's a minimum of mutual toleration and forbearance. Remember, without forbearance, Politicians play to use any means necessary to win, and so they turn the constitutional hardball. When that happens, divided government can very quickly descend into gridlock and institutional warfare. This is a world of su stolen Supreme Court seats, court packing, partisan impeachment, government shutdowns, declarations of national emergency. That's the danger I think we face today, is dysfunctional government. So a, a few months ago, uh, Steve uh, and I had the met with a group of U.S. senators, and one of them told us that he expected that we'll never again see a successful Supreme Court nomination when the president's party doesn't also control the Senate. So in other words, Merrick Garland is about to become the rule, not the exception. So our democracy, I think, is becoming increasingly dysfunctional. And you know, seeing the government shut down, uh, the longest government shut down in history, followed by threats to to declare a national emergency, and these are, these are symptoms of this, basically. 
this function. So in the face of polarization, I think it's really important to think about, you know, can our government actually respond to the genuine crises that we face, climate change, uh, stagnant wages, and so on. So, so what can be done? And I'll kind of conclude with these some, some reflections on this. Well, for one, I think it's clear that the Republican Party uh, has to change. I mean, it has to become a more diverse party. As long as the Republican Party remains an overwhelmingly white Christian party in a society as diverse as ours, they will be prone to extremism and desperate acts of constitutional hardware. So I'd just like to kind of develop this point because I think it's actually really great. Democracy requires that parties learn to lose gracefully. This means that when we lose, we accept defeat, we go home, we regroup, and we get ready for another political battle the next day. We don't cheat when we're about to lose. That's what autocrats do. But for parties to lose gracefully, two conditions really have to hold. First of all, parties have to believe that they stand a chance of winning again in the future, and they also have to believe that losing will not bring ruin its consequences. When these two conditions don't hold, losing gracefully tends to go out the window. When politicians fear that they can't win the next election, and in context of extremely high polarization, politicians' time horizons shorten. They say the future can be damned and we'll use any method that means necessary to hold on to power now. In other words, polarization and desperation lead politicians to play through. This is what happened to the German conservatives in the early 20th century. Conservatives were terrified by the prospect of giving the working class the right to vote. They viewed full suffrage not just as, a, as an attack on, the kind of, on kind of their right to govern, but as an attack on the entire social order that they dominate. So they played dirty. They turned election fraud and repression to hold on to power. Or think about Southern Democrats after the Civil War. Reconstruction of the 15th Amendment brought widespread black enfranchisement across the South. Because African Americans represent a majority, a near majority, in most Southern states, their enfranchisement represented a threat to Southern Democrats. So it challenged not only electoral dominance, but again, it threatened to overturn the, the dominant social order. So Democrats played dirty. 11 post-Confederate states passed laws, poll taxes, literacy tests, property and residency requirements to effectively eliminate African Americans from, from the right to vote. So black turnout in the South fell from 61% in 1880 to 2% in 1912. Contemporary Republicans, I fear, something similar is happening today. As currently constituted the Republican Party's medium-term electoral prospects, despite their current electoral success, are actually pretty dim. Republicans are overwhelmingly a white Christian party, and white Christians are a declining portion of the electorate. Not only that, the percentage of the electorate of younger voters are now increasingly overwhelmingly Democratic. So like the old Southern Democrats, Republicans have begun to play dirty, attacking up norms, changing rules for strictly partisan benefit, that violate basic democratic rules. And we can talk about lots of instances of that. The only way for all of this to change is if the Republican Party itself diversifies. If and when that transformation happens, and I think it will, I hope it will, our politics can be polarized. What about Democrats? There's been a lot of talk of Democrats uh, learning to fight like Republicans. Uh, it's time to fight dirty is the name of a recent book. Democrats are going to break the rules, then if Republicans are going to break the rules, then Democrats should follow suit. So I, I really disagree with this. I think in a context of polarization, Democrats must avoid the temptation to fight like Republicans. They can, of course, push aggressive policy agenda. They can push for democratizing reforms of our political system, say vote, automatic voter registration, independent commissions to do redistricting, but they must continue to abide by the norms of our, our political system. So in other words, don't push for impeachment unless the Mueller report warns it. As long as institutional and electoral channels exist, Democrats must avoid the temptation to respond in kind. If not, it's another turn in the spiral. In our experience studying other democracies in other parts of the world, this spiral doesn't end well. I think Democrats, in fact, have good medium-term prospects, unlike Republicans. And so putting our institutions at risk is actually not in Democrats' enlightened self-interest. And so more broadly, and I'll end on this note, 
when we talk about the crisis of democracy and think about the kind of moment that we're in, there's often a sense that we're kind of in a moment that's, in our politics, that's very similar to a global warming. That's kind of an analogy that people implicitly have in their mind. The world is moving in one direction. There's rising tides of disaffection, dissatisfaction, dysfunction, and things are only getting worse. And history is only moving in one direction. Now, if this assessment were correct about our politics, desperate measures would be needed. And perhaps forbearance should be abandoned. But I'd like to suggest a different metaphor drawn from the natural world, the metaphor not of global warming, but of earthquakes. The crisis of democracy, while severe, may be like an earthquake. Like with earthquakes, there may be deep and real polar fault lines of polarization that are driving it. And the crisis can itself do dramatic damage. But democratic crises, perhaps like, like, like earthquakes, tend to come and go. The biggest challenge is to get through the crisis with our institutions intact. We have to make sure that our institutions are built strong enough both to get through the earthquake and for life after the earthquake. And to do this, we can't take our institutions for granted. We cannot attack our institutions by playing hardball with them. There's simply too much at stake. Thank you.